Welcome, everyone. Thank you for your patience as we work through the technology to get ready for the three speakers. Uh, my name is Jim Neal. I'm the University Librarian at Columbia, and I'd like to welcome you to the second of a series of six programs that we're doing this year looking at different aspects of scholarly communication. Uh, we've defined scholarly communication as the creation, the distribution, the evaluation, the use, and the archiving of new knowledge. And we're looking at it through six different lenses over the course of this academic year. Last, uh, the last session, the first session in this series, uh, we had Stuart Schieber from Harvard University talking about their new open access policy. Uh, his uh, presentation and the discussions which followed are up and available on the web, and we're getting word that they're actually being viewed and used all over the world. The second session, uh, entitled Final Impact, What Factors Really Matter, looks at another aspect of the work of scholars. We all know that one of the important motivators for those who work at the university, who work in research, is the importance of the assessment of their work. Uh, peer review is one aspect of that, and factors, impact factors, has developed as another important measure looking at the quality and the use and distribution uh, and, and reuse of, 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 of research. And today we've brought uh, to Columbia three extraordinary individuals who will speak to different aspects of impact factors and different approaches to impact factors. What I'd like to do is to introduce the three panelists uh, then they will come up uh, sequentially to share their remarks. We'll ask them then to sit down and spend some time talking with you uh, about their comments and about your interests and questions about uh, impact factors. Uh, the three speakers are uh, Marion Hollingsworth. Uh, she became director of publisher relations at Thomson Reuter uh, in February 2008. Uh, she is responsible for her, the communications with publishers re regarding the indexing coverage of scholarly publications and journal metrics. Uh, she joined the company in 2000 as the manager of the public relations group. Uh, before that, she was assistant director at ENFACE, the National Federation of Abstracting and Information Services. This is an association of database producers and information service providers. Uh, she's been involved for over 20 years uh, in all aspects of academic, special, and public library work. She's BS from Temple and MS from the College of Information Science and Technology at Drexel. Uh, our second speaker will be Jevin West. He is an arts fellow in the Department of Biology at the University of, of Washington. He's presently working uh, on his PhD under Carl Bergstrom and Ben, ben Kerr. His general research focus is mathematical biology. He is interested in network theory and its applications to a wide range of problems in biology, including antibiotic resistance and disease evolution. His quantitative approach to biology has led him, thankfully, uh, to all sorts of different research directions, including the field of bibliometrics. He is the head developer of eigenfactor.org, a free website that provides tools and resources for librarians, journal editors, researchers, and publishers to assess the ever-expanding scientific literature. Our third speaker is Johan Bolin. He's a staff researcher at the Los Alamos National Laboratory. He holds his PhD in psychology from the University of Brussels and was an assistant professor of computer science at Old Dominion University. His research interests are data mining, computational sociometrics, infometrics, and digital libraries. He is presently the principal in investigator for the Mellon Foundation Measure Project, which aims to expand the set of quantitative tools available for the assessment of scholarly impact. Uh, this is a, a, a set of panelists who I think have a lot of authority, a lot of experience, and a lot of insight to share. We welcome them to Columbia. Marian. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here in New York City, this glorious fall afternoon. Impact factor, sites and context. I was speaking with some of your colleagues before this presentation about the history of the Institute for Scientific Information, which is now known as Thomson Reuters as of this year. 
and where uh, impact factor and metrics and citation databases all began. And it began with an idea in 1955. Eugene Garfield started the company, and along with his colleague Irving Scher, wanted to find ways to identify the best scholarly publications to include in the science citation index. The very first product that Dr. Garfield created was called Current Contents, which was, at the time, a very novel idea. It took the leading authoritative journals of the time, copied the tables of contents, and created an alerting system for scholarly researchers. Seems a little uh, primitive in this digital age that we live in, but it was truly quite a remarkable um, product, and it began uh, the whole concept of citation databases. Dr. Garfield and Dr. Scher realized that there were a core group of journals that accounted for most of the citations. What they wanted to be able to do was keep on top of that core group of journals so that they would know what to select and what to include in the science citation index. I remember using these paper tools back in the day, in the 60s, and the journal citation reports, which um, we now have on the web, were originally a part of the science citation index. It was a tool that enabled the Institute for Scientific Information to identify the key and important scholarly publications based on citation data. Um, in the 90s, when the era of the web came along, the journal citation report was pulled out of the science citation index and migrated to the web. And we presently have about 10 years of uh, impact factor data on the web. But this was the very beginning of citation databases and the analysis of sites to content both forward in time and backward in time, which still remains something of a, a novel and interesting a way of looking at the impact of research over time. I recently came back from the Frankfurt Book Fair, and in the Publisher Relations Department at Thomson Reuters, we index over 10,000 journals in Web of Science. So that's roughly about 3,000 publishers that we deal with uh, globally. And no matter how much they think they know about impact factors and what it means, um, I come to realize in my conversations with them that they're, they're missing key pieces of information. Routinely, we get calls almost on a daily basis from publishers wanting to know, I need an impact factor for this journal. How do I get one? You know, my authors demand it. They won't publish in my journal unless I, I have an impact factor, unless something happens. What is that something that happens? And I thought it important to give you a little background information on how we actually lead up to the impact factor metric and what's involved. There's an actual process. We have an editorial development group back at Thomson Reuters in the Philadelphia office who in many ways function like a collection development um, uh, department within a major research library. They are developing and enhancing the database, looking at various subject categories, trying to define what is the best of the best that we might need. So there are lots of different criteria. I'm going to touch on some of these briefly just to give you a sense of um, how we do what we do, a little bit of the mystery behind the impact factor. So when we're evaluating uh, pub uh, scholarly publications, we're looking for certain key criteria. Um, it has to be publishing um, on time. There's editorial content that we're looking at, international diversity, et cetera. And I'm going to just touch briefly on what these mean for us. Timeliness is really critical um, that the journal is amassing a steady flow of papers. It's meeting its publication schedule. The content must be peer reviewed. This is extremely important and one of our key criteria. Uh, we look for English language bibliographic information. 
If there's funding information in support of the research, we encourage authors to include that. You'll see eventually these are bits of metadata that we pick up and use in our indexing process. So when it comes to the editorial content, our editors, and there's a team of about over 25 <laughs> individuals, many of them are subject specialists with advanced degrees, many of them also have master's degrees from um, universities with library science programs. They're looking at, is this going to enhance our, our database? Is it going to add value? Does it offer a different perspective that might enhance scholarly discourse? They look at who the authors are, are in the journal, who the editorial board members might be. Is the research that's being reported global in context? Is this journal coming from a country that is underrepresented in our database? We also include regional journals, and we select the best of the best in regional coverage. Then, in the course of the journal evaluation process, because we're, we are creating a citation database, and because we're indexing all the references at the end of every article, we have amassed this, this huge um, um, access to data that gives us all of the cited references to the journals that we index, and the journals that we don't. So we're able to quickly see if this is a new journal that's coming to us, how is it being cited in our universe within the web of science? And again, journal impact factors are only looking at the universe that's contained within web of science. We also look at the self-citation rate of journals when we're evaluating them for selection in um, our Web of Science product. And in the Web of Science, 80% of the journals have less than 20% self-citation rates. This is really key and important, um, particularly um, if there are any publishers in the room. Uh, it has certainly been brought to our attention the uh, misuse of self-citation rates um, within the database. In 2006, for the release of the, the 2006 Journal Citation Report, which was in fact June of 07, it was the first time that Thomson Reuters suppressed approximately seven journals from being listed in the Journal Citation Reports because of high self-citation rates. This year, when we released the 2007 Journal Citation Reports, there were uh, in fact nine titles that um, were suppressed. The first year we were very um, courteous about it and we kind of kept it quiet, notified the publishers. Uh, this year uh, we were a little bit more discreet. <coughs> I've circled the notices file within the journal citation reports. And if you click through that in the product news section, you'll see a list of some nine titles, many of whom have in excess of 90% self-citation rates. So these have been suppressed from the journal citation report. Um, it, our feeling is that it doesn't accurately reflect, reflect the journal's true participation in the scholarly discourse. So we're really paying attention uh, to this. And I'm, I'm highlighting this because towards the end of my talk, I want to uh, share with you some information about some new developments. So once a journal is accepted, the subject categories are selected. This is very key. This puts a journal, it, it includes a journal in the subject category along with its peers. We look at the scope of the journal and the scope of the subject categories. And we make a fit and a determination as to where it is best indexed. In this example, for this particular journal, we've uh, assigned it to um, the Science Citation Index. Uh, it's in two editions of current contents, clinical medicine as well as life sciences. It's, life sciences is extremely competitive to be included in that. And it's also included in biological abs abstracts and biosis previews. Document types is probably the, the trickiest part and uh, an area where I have my most com conversations with publishers. We go through each journal that we index and we assign and determine what counts as an article, what is editorial material, and we do this for purposes of the impact factor calculation as you'll see very shortly. 
in the web of science, someone can search on a particular journal and see very clearly out of however many records there might be in this particular instance, over 62,000 particular records for this journal, the majority of them are, in fact, articles. So it just gives you a sense of what is the content like in a particular journal. Researchers may be interested in this, particularly if they are looking to submit papers. So once the journal's been accepted for coverage and it's going to be indexed, we need at least a minimum of three years of citation data in order to calculate the impact factor. This is not the case for those rare journals that we pick up in its first volume, which would get listed the next year in the journal citation report. So the calculation is very simple, but yet um, is something that has to be explained many times over. It cites in a given year to anything in the journal the previous two years, divided by the actual articles in the journal in the, in the former two years. The impact factor is a journal level metric. It's not an article level metric, and it doesn't really tell you anything about authors. In the denominator, we include original research articles, review articles, technical notes. Um, many of the journals that we index are, in fact, um, publications from scholarly associations where they will hold annual meetings and publish full conference papers. If we index those full conference papers, they're included in the denominator as well. So once impact factors are uh, published, um, it's important to try to keep the impact factor as a metric in context with its subject category and its ranking. Look at like with like. Compare like to like. I thought the best way to demonstrate this is to just take a look at the journal citation report and do a search of, of all the science journals that are in Web of Science and included in the JCR and sort them by impact factor. And in the science edition of the JCR, the top journal has an impact factor of 69.026, huge. Um, number 10 journal is Nature, and its impact factor is 28.751. On the other hand, if you go into the social sciences edition of the JCR and you do the very same search, you're going to see very different numbers you're going to see that the top journal in the social sciences edition has an impact factor of 17.462, and the number 10 journal, 6.667. So what does that really tell you? Not a whole lot, because the impact factor needs to be put in the context of the subject categories. In this example, this is a social science journal, it has an impact factor of 5.017, but it's been categorized and placed in two different subject categories, in business and in management. So if you're thinking the top journal in social sciences is 17 point something, so this probably doesn't look very good in comparison. But in fact, it ranks number one of 72 journals in the business category, and it ranks number two of 81 journals in the management category. So out of context, it doesn't appear like much, but in context means everything. Also, the discipline is very important to, to consider. Um, in applied mathematics, for instance, there's a longer citation window. The impact factor is a very narrow window in time. It's looking at citations in one year to the previous two. It's very narrow. In mathematics, it's not unusual for the citation tail to take a lot longer. So in this instance here, the top eight journals in applied mathematics. The top number is 5.099, and the bottom, number 8, is 1.784. The other thing that we've uh, incorporated into the journal citation report to help with the analysis and interpretation and use of the impact factor are such things as the uh, subject category summary lists, where we look at a whole subject category, and we take the aggregate data so that it makes a little bit more sense. So in this case, in applied mathematics, the aggregate impact factor is a 0 0.856. And this helps researchers, editorial board members, 
um, publishers understand where their journal is in the context of the subject category. We also include information about related journals and the citing and citing relationships. What kinds of topics are shared? What are the peer groups? Who is citing whom, if you will? We include the journal impact factor um, and all of the citations and how it's calculated along with the immediacy index, which basically means how often is an article cited in the first year of publication. But the interesting part that I think is often overlooked is the journal source data that we include um, down in the bottom, this area here. What you'll notice is with the ratio of um, articles and references to articles, you'll see that there's a large number of other items, which would be editorial, comments, letters, et cetera. What are the citable characteristics? What makes an article an article? Well, certainly the number of references might be one way of looking at that, as you see. Um, in this uh, instance, the average review has about 46 cited references, articles about 17, and the other items have less than one, usually don't have any references at all. So that is the direction where we're headed in terms of how we're going to uh, determine document types in the future. We're going to be looking more at what are the characteristics that make an item citable or not. Um, there's a lot, a lot of opportunities for, shall I say, fun and games a little bit with, with uh, trying to uh, maneuver it. Uh, for instance, there are sections within journals that uh, are called letters. Well, they may be letters or they may just really be articles. If they have charts, they have graphs, they have abstracts and keywords and cited references, it's likely an article. So in the process of creating the citation database, we're creating what I like to think of as a data soup. We're capturing all the bibliographic information, the abstract, the keywords, the author names, their email addresses, their addresses, institutional affiliation, very important. This is uh, another opportunity for um, an institution to find out who on their staff are publishing and where. We capture the country level at the journal and also at the um, level of the author. Any funding information and conference data if the paper was presented there. So this creates just a huge pool of potential data for other metrics beyond the impact factor. And here are just a few that uh, I mentioned, including uh, such things as H index and potentially a self-citation rate. So coming out the end of this quarter, probably within the next month or so, maybe even less, are some enhancements that we're making to the journal citation report, which hopefully will give researchers, publishers, authors a better sense of um, the metric and its uses over time. We're going to be including a five-year impact factor for more accurate trend analysis. We are going to be uh, showing the journal's self-cites. We're including some visualization tools and a rank in all the subject categories. And this is a mock-up. This, this is not real data, but this is what it will uh, eventually look like within the journal citation report. We'll include the regular impact factor. We'll include a five-year impact factor and all of the data, as you can see at the bottom, which uh, will include uh, the statistics for how we came to the sites to recent items and the number of articles the previous two years. We will be releasing this with the 2007 JCR. So we'll be taking what we released in June and enhancing it for a, a re-release. I think the most inter interesting thing will be the analysis of the journal self-sites. What you see is um, down at the bottom, the, the table will show how many of the self-sites, uh, the journal sites are self-sites, and what percentage contribute to the impact factor calculation. So in this instance here, the journal's impact factor is a 1.033, but if you take out the self-sites, it's 0.918. Again, we're including visualization tools, 
And if the journals included in more than one set, subject category, we're making it a whole lot easier for um, you to see exactly how many journals are in the category, what the rank of the journal is, and what quartile in that category the journal is. Well, thank you very much. I hope, if anything, what you've uh, learned from this is to take the impact factor. It's a single journal metric. Keep it in the context of, of which it was intended. Uh, remember that it is not a statement about an author. It is not a statement about a particular article. It is a journal level metric. From the citation database that we create, certainly we have access to a lot of data that we can uh, include and create other additional metrics. For instance, users of Web of Science will note that the articles will increment at the time cited level. Uh, this happens on a weekly basis when we upload new index content to the database. The impact factor, on the other hand, is just a static number. Thank you very much. Um, I guess, can I entertain some questions now? Well, um, Jevin is going to be setting up. We're also going to reconvene as a complete panel so we can have more discussion later as well. Yes, sir. I've got a question for you. How did the original impact factor decide on the two year previous data? Because now you have uh, two years and five years, so I just wondered what was the original uh, concept that you know. You know, I think at the time, and I'm, I'm not completely certain, I know there was, um, there has always been uh, keen interest on the part of publishers and researchers uh, who publish in their journals, to, and particularly for fields like mathematics and the like, where a longer citation tale would uh, uh, look much better than the five-year impact factor, would look much better than a regular two-year impact factor. But, um, but that was, I think, a metric and a time frame that Garfield felt was optimal. Um, and I think that um, what will happen in the future remains to be seen. I, I w mentioned the five-year impact factor at a talk that I gave at the Frankfurt Book Fair. And publishers were um, very excited about it and, and would likely then use the metric that features their journal the best. Of course. Thank you. Yeah. Actually, the anecdote that I heard is that when the Eigen Factor was uh, first proposed, that Eugene Garfield only had two years of citation data. And realizing that maybe a little short, uh, we went ahead and calculated and defined the Eigen Factor. And then the next year, the year after that, we didn't want to change the definition, which is insanity, because then there would be no basis of comparison. And as the, the, data, the database is really stuck to the two year uh, time window. But that's just a uh, that's just what I heard. Yeah. It's a rational decision. It's a, uh, it, um, well, it is what it is. But certainly with the five-year impact factor, if you noticed in my what second or third slide, we have about 10 years of JCR data on the web. So I don't know what the future holds in terms of um, other impact factors over a longer period of time. It could be very interesting. So why don't we move to the second speaker? Uh, but first of all, I want to thank the organizers. This is, this is uh, quite an honor, and it's a lot of fun for me to come talk to a group of people that this was originally created for. Eigenfactor actually started as a little side project, really like a two-week project. We thought, let's try some things and apply some of the, the mathematics that we use in network science uh, that we apply in all sorts of different, uh, to different biology problems. And lo and behold, a year and a half later, almost two years now, it's, uh, it's just growing like crazy. It's hard to even keep track. But uh, first of all, yeah, my name is Jevin, and I am from the University of Washington in a biology department. And um, what I'm going to tell you about today, I'm going to fly through some of the tools that we've created at Eigenfactor. I'm going to show you some of the new stuff. I'm not going to show you all the new stuff because there's still some bugs in it. But before I do that, I kind of want to give you, uh, I want to put Eigenfactor into context, especially in regards to this meeting and how it relates to maybe things that you might be using. And also kind of give you some of the underlying philosophy that drives some of the research that we do in the lab. So, and some of you may have heard this part of the story, but I like to give it, especially at a, an assessment meeting like this, uh, the, 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 the story of assessment kind of, at least in our regards to this project, started in 1927 at a small college in Southern California, Pomona College. And librarians were faced with problems that they face today, even worse today than they did even back in 1927, and they didn't have enough money. And of course, when you don't have enough money, that, that forces a question, a tough question for librarians, especially for those that want to include as much as possible for all their users of the library, that what journals should we buy and what journals 
not to buy. Well, it turns out at that college, Pomona College, there were two chemists that published uh, a pretty seminal, at the time, paper in science that, that provided at least one way of making better decisions at how we should be deciding. And, and uh, that's counting citations and which, deciding which journals to buy and which, which we shouldn't. And at, right now, that seems pretty trivial. It seems like it's, of course you wouldn't just count citations. There's so many other things that you need to take into account. But it turns out at this time, it was actually a really, uh, at the time, novel approach to it. And it's, it, it also turns out that it's had a, a huge impact on how science is communicated and actually the structure of science, especially when we look at some of the maps that we've worked on. Um, so let's fast forward to 1955 when Eugene Garfield came around. And, and since Marianne actually talked about a lot of this, I'm not going to go into detail about what impact factor was. But impact factor was another big leap at the time as a way of, of, of assessing the journals what to buy, what not to buy. So let's, let's fast forward again. We're fast forwarding faster time here, 1955. Now let's come to, to now. So where are we? So we, uh, we have made some, uh, some, some, some uh, headway in the last couple of years. But before some of these, the, the, a lot of the work that's been done in different labs, unfortunately, uh, Impact Factory, even though at the time was really uh, was a reasonable approach, a first, first pass, and it still is good, especially when people are, are, are comfortable with that measure. But unfortunately, a lot of people are, are, uh, know that it affects hiring decisions. It affects library subscriptions. You, this crowd definitely knows about that. It also, of course, affects people outside of the library community. It affects people's promotion and tenure. It affects ad placement. That's actually a huge effect. I think there was recently a paper that came out and showed how much money this affects, or this, the, uh, the influence this has on, on advertisements and journals. Also, for those uh, uh, familiar with the RAE, impact factor is a large part of the decisions that are made there. Um, university rankings, which is important to students. And so scientists, of course, obsess. And I've done this joke before, but I love giving it for no one's have heard of it because it's, it's, it's true. You always get a chuckle. And editor scheme, and of course, publishers negotiate, and journals pander, and administrators nag, and librarians cause problems too, but I, I don't put those in because the library. Needs. So everyone suffers, and that's a problem. And so instead of, of serving, uh, impact factor serving scientists, unfortunately, it's been the other way around. And the tail is unfortunately wagging the dog. So, um, so in, in, instead of, of, of uh, the, uh, the impact factor serving scientists, it's, it's the other way around. So and if many, uh, there's millions of articles about this. This is just one of, uh, literally, I have probably over 150 articles about this. Uh, people are comfortable with knowing it. So really, what the, this is where this is starts to begin. What, what do we do? What, what's, what's, how do we better evaluate the scholarly? It has to be done. Um, what's the best way? Is, that must be a phone somewhere. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going this way, you guys are going this way. Um, so uh, so the, the thing is, you need to read it. But that is the best way, and there's no better way. I think Factor certainly does not take uh, precedence over reading the journals, reading how, you know, there's all these promotion and tenure, and it drives me crazy sitting in on these committees that people are just looking at numbers. They're not taking, I know people are limited by time, just like this. Who has time for that, unfortunately? But um, we do, there is a legitimate need for quantitative measures. So that's kind of where we come in. We like to ask questions. A lot of this kind of started with questions like this. How do we value uh, a journal like Science or the journal like Cell? How do biologists, because we're biologists and we're also, uh, we work with an economist, how do, how do they cite papers in economics and vice versa? Also, um, how do bundles? A lot of you, uh, bundles is a big issue and we're actually building, uh, we almost got the uh, tool built for dealing with bundles and stuff. So a good metric, this is before we even started, we wanted to make sure that a good metric, most and for, first and foremost, was freely available. Because we think that bibliometrics is only as good as it's open and can be replicated. So if it can't be replicated and it's not open, it really doesn't do the community much good. So we want to make sure all the tools that we develop, at least that can be applied to all sorts of various data sets, are freely available. We also want it to be integrated, and integrated in all sorts of databases that we have. Also integrating just within uh, the data set that we use um, as our first pass was the Thompson data set. Want to like collate also social and natural science and a lot of the gray literature. So we want to also valid across fields. And this is a tricky this is a tricky thing. Not that we've solved this perfectly, but the method itself, intrinsic in the method, it, it at least allows for more um, better comparisons across fields. We also want it difficult to cheat. Um, we've done a lot of, actually Carl, who's the other um, starter of the eigenfactor, has done a lot of work with game theory, and we actually talk about these things all the time. How can you develop a measure, not just eigenfactor, that's difficult to cheat? We also want it maximally informative. So that's, that's using tools that we have from network science 
and from information theory that really get the most out of the data that's sitting in there. And it turns out these data sets are incredibly rich. There's a wealth of information in these citation data sets and these citation networks. So eigenfactor is a step. But we weren't, definitely weren't the first. Actually, I've told you on this, and he, he hears it all the time while we've been to two of these things together. He actually came up with a paper before we even started on eigenvector centrality, which is essentially the core. It's the, it's the engine that drives the algorithm that we use with eigenfactor. And this is very similar to the same sort of algorithm that Google uses to rank the web. So we know how powerful these eigenvector centrality things are. So I'll use this term eigenvector centrality. I'll, I'll explain a little bit about it. But this is one of the key slides until then I start getting into the fun tools. La last of the conceptual stuff and the introduction. But this is, this is what we've been doing for the last, I don't know, maybe almost century. We have, we've been looking at a circle. No, we've been actually just, th if this is just a journal, and this, this represents a journal. We've been just looking at the number. You know, impact factor is a little different than that, so there was, a, there was a leap there. And there are, of course, it wasn't just, oh, we'll just divide by the number of articles. There was, there, was, there was more to it. But the idea is that we really were just looking at this. Well, this is what eigenfactor does. It actually takes into account the rest of the network. It takes into account what's citing what. And that's what made the Page and Brin so rich and, 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 the, and their algorithm so successful. There are other sorts of things that they're, they're building on it and they're changing it all the time. But they, admit, they have been quoted many times as saying the PageRank algorithm, which is essentially this idea of looking at hyperlinks in the web, but instead we're looking at citations in journals, uh, essentially looking at what's citing what. There's, there's a lot of information here. It's a really, it's a beautiful story um, to tell, and actually there's more even to learn about, I'm sure, that just the things that we work on. So another way of looking at it, I, I give it this way, impact factor puts its shutters on and, and looks at the numbers coming in. And actually it turns out, and I always, so I'm giving always the good and bad, impact factor, it turns out, is a really pretty good, a reasonable approximation to some of these sorts of Things. It's not the same, and we've done a lot of uh, analysis and, statistic, uh, and done some statistical analysis to show that they're not the same, and they do should give different information. But they, it's a reasonable approximation, and it's a lot easier to explain, actually, than eigenfactor is. But I'm going to try to explain it a little bit with this. So again, this is just, if I had more time, I'd go into the history of where this really, one of the where areas that it came from. It was a sociologist that was, his name was Bonasich in 1972. He was interested in looking at um, so, uh, networks uh, of you know, who's, who do important people have important friends and this sort of thing. That was, that was his idea. But the, the, the words that we use, eigenvector centrality, and applying it to the citation data set is what we're doing and what um, uh, uh, like Johan has proposed. So, so Google, like I said, it, it, it links important um, websites by hyperlinks. Instead, we look at journals and we cite them. So that's, that's what we're doing. We're essentially taking a citation network. We're looking at the structure of the network. So it's a model, and there's, there's a lot of different ways. Actually, the best way, I'm not going to show you, because I'm doing a little experiment on you. Uh, I want to see how many questions I have after using this old one, because I'm comparing it to this new one that I've given in a few other places, and I had less questions. So I think it might be better. But I'm going to give you this one. The, the, I think it's still OK. So the idea is, if you went to the library, and you were to open some random journal in your collections and, and open some random citation, follow that. Open up that journal, follow some random citation, do that again, do that again. And if you could do that for an infinite amount of time in the library, after you've done your infinite walk, if that's possible, you come back to me or come back to the website we have and you say, this is how much time I spent at science. This is how long I spent the Journal of Biological Chemistry. And if it's like 1.99, that means 1.99% of all the time I was there. The other way to look at it is if you, you would make a pile of journals. And so you're walking around the library, you, get, you came to this journal through your random walk, you put a pile. And after all your walk, you look back at your piles and you see how high the piles are. And so those numbers that you'll see with eigenfactor are a percentage of time. It gives you an idea how long maybe your users would, would be using certain journals. And so you can actually apply this not just to the Thompson data set, you can actually apply it to your own collections. Let's say you just have your own little uh, data set that you know that's all your users are using. Then what you do is you can apply it to that data set. So what you do is you go to a journal, you look at this, you follow this, and you do this forever. So that gives you an idea of what, where does your researcher spend in the long run. So it measures total value. Eigenfactor, there's two main measures we have, eigenfactor and article influence. Eigenfactor is a measure of total value, so that's the total time you spend. Whereas article influence measures a little more prestige, and, and I'm being less and less uh, versus using terms like prestige um, stuff, but 
because um, I, I, I've been asked that question and I'm not sure, but anyway, um, I, for now, it's the term I'm going to use. So article influence measures prestige, essentially the eigenfactor divided by the number of articles. So it's a, it, but it also is normalized so that the average journal tells you, it is is has a value of one. So if you see, let's say, an article influence of 15, it means that journal has an article influence of like 15 times the average journal, excuse me, of the av average journal within the, the data set. So it's, it's, easy, it's more comparable, article influence is more comparable to impact factor than eigenfactor is. So citations in this case, the eigenfactor article influence, citations from good journals are worth more. It doesn't mean they get more, but they're worth more. Uh, citations from frugal fields like mathematics, it doesn't give many citations out. They actually uh, don't get, they don't get robbed as my eyes, I'm not trying to throw right a term either, but uh, we'll say they don't, they, they get as much credit. Non-scholarly publications can be ranked because you can, by the, the, the method itself, and I'll, I'm not going to explain it right now, but essentially you can rank all sorts of other um, scholarly literature that's never been ranked before. So even just within the Thompson data set, which is what we use, which is an incredibly clean, really well put together data set with those da uh, the, the journals that are ISI journals, there are lots of uh, other uh, items in the database too that are cited and based on eigenfactor method, you can rank those the same way, in a fair way. So you can rank journals that have never, we've had many, many people ask us like, so am I in the database, can I see what I'm ranking? A lot of times they've never seen uh, their eigenfactor or ever had any ranking and now they, they get at least an eigenfactor. So another really powerful thing, and this is now starting to get into the new tools, um, is, this, uh, is that eigenfactor is additive. So what does that mean? Additive, it means that you can take numbers, all the numbers of a particular set of journals or a bundle of journals, and you can add them up. And that will give you, again, a measurement of the value of that bundle or that group of, um, of journals. So if you have, let's say, science is two and nature is three and cells one, then you'd have an eigenfactor of six for the group. And that gives you 6% of the time you'd spend at those particular journals. Incredibly powerful because you can do a lot of things, which I'm going to show you a couple. One of them is you can do really cool things like this. this. What you're looking at right now is a map of science. I'm going to show you how we do the mapping. We have to combine this with the mapping. But each one of those squares represents a journal. And I'm guessing that, yeah, thanks. If we'll turn those lights down, then we'll turn them back up. The big square, can anyone guess what that probably is? The biggest square? What journal? Science. Science. Oh, good, good guess. It was, it's, it's nature, but uh, it's science is next. The next, actually, journal of biological chemistry is. This is eigenfact, remember, so this isn't per. Value. So the, 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 the way it's partitioned actually gives you an idea of, uh, uh, that's, that's combined with the, the mapping stuff that we do, and so I'll, I'll explain that more. But what you can do is, I'll just go over here real quick. So you can actually look at where ideas, we say where ideas are coming from, there's more than that. But you can look at the flow. You can click on a journal and see it's clicked on nature, and you can see where the flow is going in one step. You can look at it two steps. You can look at after it's converged. You can actually look where ideas come. Let's say, I don't know if you can see this. Can everyone see? Yeah, you can see that. This is, uh, this is uh, economics. What do you notice about economics compared to some of these other journals? They kind of only cite themselves. There's all sorts of, I mean, this, I could give an entire talk because we've been playing with this for the last month and a half, two months, but we just got the technology, we basically got the code, the bugs out of it. Um, you, you, so many stories are popping out of this type of representation of, of analyzing flow. So you can, you can go over any journal and it'll tell you what the journal is, eventually what field. You can also look at the flow and the flow actually tells you something about not only what that time step is, but actually gives you projections as to where, because they're trends, a lot of times they're trends. So I'll, I'll, I can show you more about this later if we have more time, or I can show anyone afterwards that wants to, sh to look at that. Thank you for turning that, that down. So something else is cost effectiveness. And we're finding that this tool is probably the most hit tool that we get. At least it's probably the most useful for librarians that have to take into account price. Essentially, it, there's more to it, but the basic idea is that you can take the eigenfactor and you can essentially divide by the price of that journal. And that gives you another way of valuing it. So if we go to the web, I'm going to try this. I Hopefully this works. Oh, what? Okay. Okay. All right. So go to eigenfactor.org real quick. I hope the server's not down or that we have internet here. Uh, come on. It's thinking. 
OK. So there's all sorts of uh, cool things here. Um, but I'm just going to show just a little bit of cost effectiveness. So does anyone have a particular field they want to look at? Or I don't know. Medicine. Oh, medicine. OK. Sounds good. Hey, first come, first serve. So medicine, where is it here? How about a particular area of medicine? General, internal? How about that? Is that OK? OK. All right. So if we, if we search here, did I click on it? OK. If I click on it, you can actually see, so the purple bar represents the amount of eigenfactor, the percentage of time that you would take total in that field. Because you, you take that field, you start doing the walk around in the field, and that gives you a percentage. So the purple bar represents that much. The bar in the bottom is the green. So you start to get an idea of the value of a particular, or let's say you have a budget amount, and you have, let's say, $4 million to spend. I'm sure we all have at least that much to spend. Yeah, no. I don't know about that. But uh, the idea is, and this is just, uh, we're actually releasing, we're, hopeful, we're developing still now what this real, the tool is going to do, that, but this is kind of the, the first pass at it. But the idea is if you scroll down, what are you noticing? Immediately you're getting a lot of your eigenfactor, almost all the eigenfactor, but now you're starting to increase a lot more in price. And you're not adding that much more eigenfactor. So that actually tells you, that gives you a, an idea of what you can, like when you include price, if you're starting to look at bundles. And there's other things that we're doing, but when you hear cost effectiveness, again, this is a, one I could give a whole talk on, um, is this cost effectiveness stuff. That this, this, a lot of this work comes from Ted Bergstrom, who's an economist at UCSB, and he's done a lot of stuff with the economics of, of uh, scientific publishing. But you can do things like click on journals, too, as well, and you can get trends of the citation information. We also have more pricing updating coming as well, so you can look at all this sort of information. So there are other tools. And since I'm here, because I don't want to flip back again, I'm going to just show you one other tool. Um, we actually have a bunch of things we're releasing. Probably the most exciting thing, in my opinion, um, we have is coming up. We have actually two or three new things coming up. We we're, we're still want to make sure we get it all right, make sure we understand the methods, and, uh, and make sure that there's no bugs. But it's coming out, hopefully, maybe in the next, let's say, three months, probably maybe six months or something. But this is one of the things that you can do with all these metrics that I'm talking about. So this is a way of taking this rich, all this data that you deal with, and trying to try to pull stories out of it. Try to understand what these, all these variables, you're hearing all these different measures. How do we represent it? Well, that's part of the project. It's not just developing algorithms. It's not just messing around with fun things that we like to work on. It also, we want to develop actual tools that can help you. And this is, this is an example of one. This isn't, like, this is actually made through um, this Google Docs application. But what you can do is you can, you can change any of the things that we've talked about. Let's say you want eigenfactor. You can switch things. You can go, I'll go back to article influence. You can actually log things, so you can actually get an idea. You get, should be, oh, there it is, it's up there. You can log it. And that, that, depending on what you're looking at and what you want to do, you can get an idea. So if you play this, you can watch over time how, what's happening to these journals. Eigenfactor, the size of the circle, I should mention, is eigenfactor. And you can also change that as well. So what's great is you can start to see what's happening. And I'm actually showing you one of the least, I wouldn't say it's the least interesting, but it's the top 25 journals. When you start getting into fields that you know, like my field, I know the publishing record, I know some of the editors, I know policies they've changed, and there's some really interesting stories, especially in the field of ecology and evolution with one particular journal. So actually, there's, there's tons of journals. And, I, and uh, again, this, if you want to show uh, uh, the sort of like if you know something specific about um, a field, I'd be interested in hearing what you, you have to say to the explanations of some of these asteroids that are coming in. But like for example, let's say just, just this one, there's not as much interesting in this, but let's just collect some of the, click on some of the medical journals. And let's start back again in 1997 and let's watch, uh, let's maybe click on this side guy. So explain this to me for those that might know these journals. And I, I really don't know the story. There's not much happening in the, the late 90s. And then, and then in 2000, something that the journals in medicine, something's happening. And I don't know what it is. But it's not, you, can't, you can do this. You can also do this at the article level. You can do all sorts of different things. But the idea, again, is that there are powerful new tools out there that we get, not from just our lab, that we're you know, pulling other people's ideas. This is, these aren't, some of these things are just things that we're using from other technologies, too. But there, there are ways of looking at this complicated data. So back here. So I don't know what my time is, but I'm gonna, I'd like to jump into. So the data that we have right now is the Thompson data. Um, 
it's uh, for a first pass of this stuff, it was the cleanest data set. It's the one that people are most familiar with. But we can also apply this to any data set. We're actually working with lots of other groups too, um, online archives like SSRN, Social Science Research Network at Harvard, and we're working with, uh, we worked a little bit with ADS and Michael Kurtz, like Johan uh, has been, we were talking about at lunch. And then also, I mean, all sorts of different, different groups. So it's definitely, we, we really aren't in the business of gathering the data. We're in the business of, well, it's not even a business because we're a science lab, we give everything away. But we, we really just want to develop tools that other people can use. And again, it, this was originally made for librarians, so it's always fun to talk to librarians. So mapping science, I'll just blast through this because I know I'm going to be late on the time and I want Johan to get to it. But this is one area I'm particularly excited about. I've always been interested in the history of science. I've been interested in where ideas come from, um, what causes births of fields or disintegration of fields, or what, 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 cause, what, what stimulated or what was the impetus to some beautiful experiment that you read about when you're an undergrad. But the idea is, this is the, this is the philosophy. And this is actually one of the philosophies that drives a lot of the stuff that we're doing with Eigenfactor in general. Because the Eigenfactor is more, the name is actually a project. It's actually, it's an idea kind of. And then the actual metric, that's where we use it again so it can be confusing. But it's an idea that science is about the flow of ideas. Our models are representing flow. And we use networks. This is, I, I forgot to take this out, but since it's here, because it's, it's too fun to talk about. But this is a network, and this is a way of representing flow. Networks represent flow. Um, and this is the blue or boys and the pink or uh, girls. And, and the links between them um, are relationships. And, uh, and the idea is that you can look at these networks and then immediately start to tell stories again. It's just like these tools, looking for ways of, of telling stories. Well, being a biologist, this is the stuff I've been dealing with for the last probably, uh, I would say, five years. I get these, and this is what kind of got me into eigenvector stuff. I was getting so tired of looking at these. I, I was interested in networks. I was interested in applying some of these powerful tools. But this is what they, we were coming up with. This is a yeast protein interaction network. They're beautiful. They're, they're actually um, something that you'd like to put up on your wall as a poster, but they don't, they're not a tool. They're not what we consider a map. So the idea is to simplify and highlight the data. And that's no trivial task. Um, compression is, and is, is something that we're always trying to do in our minds. And cartographers are doing it. Google's trying. Everyone's trying to do this. But how do you do it? So the idea is if I was to give you a map, and this is a map of Boston, and I was asking you, OK, you need to go from the airport to, let's say, Harvard. How do you get there? Um, this is just too much. There's just too much detail. You don't need to see every street, every every tree, every river, every, you need something that looks more like this. You need, you need what we consider a map, something that's a tool that you can get around. And so this is kind of what we're doing with the citation network. This actually only represents right now, it's an ugly picture, it's purposely kind of ugly, but it only represents about 5% of the citation network that we deal with. It's really ugly. Well, through some development that Martin Rosval's done and um, Carl in the lab, there's really only about four or five of us that, that work on this stuff. And he's done an, a, a really nice job of um, applying some, some um, advancements in information there, and actually old concepts, and has produced a map of science. So the map of science, if we could turn the lights down just a little bit again, if that's all right, thanks. Um, the circles here represent the amount of time that you'd be walking around um, all the journals in a particular year. This is uh, 2004. Um, and the, the, the arrows between them is flow between fields. Now this is, you can actually zoom in and you can zoom out. So you can look just like a real map, you can add detail, you can take detail out. <laughs> Excuse me. And so you can see there are some fields that get more, uh, there's more flow between them than others. Unfortunately, it's still kind of hard for you to see, but there are, there, there tends to be this trend of applied science to basic science. There's this flow, which is really kind of, what kind of interesting. Also, there's so many other things that, uh, we, we've had so many uh, lunch conversations over the map and things we keep finding. We've been looking at it now for at least six months and just staring at it, looking at it, and again, zooming in and out. And the really cool thing is that you can actually do these sorts of things over time, too. So the, the, like the idea that most people thought that the, the science was a ring. Well, it turns out it's more of like a U-shape based on the citation data. And uh, a lot of people ask us, well, how does it come up with the fields? That's the one area of the algorithm. The rest of it's all algorithmically done. We choose those based on the, the journals that we see. So this is a different way of categorizing than categorizing before. Instead of um, arbitrarily choosing or letting a journal, or however it's decided to decide a category, we let the citations decide. And we've actually had journals email us and say, actually, that's not our category. Didn't you see our category? We're like, well, look at your citation patterns. And, and that's, what, that's what the algorithm came up with. 
Again, not going to go through details, but the mapping stuff is fun. You can zoom into parts, like this is zooming in now, at just social sciences. And you start to see some interesting things. For example, sociology breaks into behavioral and institutional sociology. You see a lot of the applied sciences popping in from psychology and psychology, psychiatry and psychology. You can look at individual fields. Um, there's, there's all sorts of things you can do with the map. But it's also a tool. So this is an example. There's many ways that we're applying this as a tool. And that's the difference between, I think, a lot of the maps that are being created. We want it to be a tool, just like a regular map. So right here, this is an example of some holdings from like JSTOR. Uh, JSTOR, as you know, is this big repository that holds a lot of journals. The, the, the yellow is the number of journals that they hold within science, and the purple is stuff they don't have. So you can see they're heavily weighted in economics and political science and sociology and areas like this, but you can do this for any sort of holdings. You could do it for your own holdings. You could see where you're missing, where you need to add, but you don't, do, you can, don't have to do it on all of just science. You can actually apply these, using these algorithms, you can also, you, you can apply them to um, uh, your own map, like make a, your own map of your own holdings and look at these sorts of things. So that's one thing. So there's also the interactive map, and again, I guess I'll flip, many of you maybe have already seen this, but I might as well show it for those that haven't seen it. Uh, this is another example. Let's see. Go to here. Okay. Another example of a tool. So if we go to, you can surf around this map, adding detail, taking away detail. You can go into psychiatry. You can see there. Uh, you can't see it very well on the screen, but you can, you can find, first of all, all this stuff, again, is free available. Everything I say is on, well, not everything, because a lot of the new stuff we haven't put up. But uh, a lot of the things I've been on the web are all there, so you can check these things. But you can notice education's only citing, most of the flow only comes from psychiatry, but not vice versa. Let's go to education. What do we got there? You have psychology. Let's go into psychiatry. You can actually, the beautiful thing, again, is you can add more detail. You can look in more detail like you can with a map and see what's connected. Eventually, you can get, be able to zoom down to individual papers and, and do those sorts of things. You can also look at the top journals on the side. So uh, again, that's a blast through just some of the tools that we're using. The idea, OK, uh-oh. OK, I'll come back here. The summary is there is a lot of things you can do with this, these data sets. They're incredibly rich. Like I said before, there is a wealth of information. But it's not easy to, to get those things. I mean, if you look at it in tabular form, or you, um, or you try to, trying to make decisions, it's not an easy thing. And it, it's continually, even with these tools, it's going to be hard decisions to make. But, but what we do in our lab is we apply some of the things that we apply in other fields, especially within biology, where we deal with complicated data sets, too. And so it's really easily transferable to the field of bibliometrics. Plus, we have uh, a personal interest, both uh, Carl Bergstrom and Ted Bergstrom, uh, his father, have always had interest in the economics of publishing in journals. And so it's been just, it's been a nice sort of uh, synergy, to use a cliche, but it's been, it's been a lot of fun. And most of the fun comes from working with this group. I mean, really, uh, the reason why we, if we don't think something's fun, we're on to something else, and we're having a lot of fun right now. But the person on the left is Carl Bergstrom. He's the, he's the main guy. He's the PI. He's uh, probably couldn't have uh, found a better guy to work with. He's, he's creative. He works in so many different, he's published in immunology, in economics, and I bet everything. Uh, Ted Bergstrom, who's a dad, his dad is also, he's an economic, e economist at the UCSB. Ben Althaus has been an undergrad that's been working with me, just incredibly talented. Moritz Steffener has helped do some of the visuals. He's in Germany. He's actually going to come visit us in Seattle in a couple weeks. We're really excited about that. And Martin Roswell, who's been a postdoc, who's, uh, his background is physics, and he's done a lot of stuff with network in the field of network science. So um, with that, uh, I'll end there, and thanks for your attention. And if there's any questions, I'll be glad to, to answer them. So. Okay. Uh, I'll take questions or should we maybe do it here, right? Afterwards? If possible, we get on to the third one. Absolutely. So I know that's a long Yeah, no, 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 no. No, you should set up. So are there any questions while Johan is setting up? Just still pondering or they give too much information or a lot of a lot of questions? <laughs> Good. Well, is there one? I could I'll take one while because it might take over there. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, I've listened very carefully, and I've raised the same question that I've raised yes. the question. I'm so glad. I, was, I told you to ask me this question. So. The amount of time, time being something that I can find, and I yes. understand, that the researcher spends with each journal, are you really counting time? No, it's a misnomer, and we should be careful about how we write it. As mathematicians, we loosely use metaphors. 
And um, that is a misnomer for, on, on our part. It is time in the model that we're using. Actually, you're fine. You're so it's not, it's the actual, if you were to jump in this universe of an infinite walk around the library, it's the amount of time that you'd be at a journal. You obviously can't walk infinitely around the library, but you can think of that when you think of eigenfactor. You can think of, if you could do that, it would be the amount of time that you would be at a journal. So when you're in this other universe of walking in your library for infinite, and you have infinite amount of time to do this, then it would be the amount of time that you spend in a journal if you were just constantly following citations randomly. How much time were you at a particular article or a particular journal? Because as the citations, it's a, it's a tough one to grapple your head around, but it's this iterative scheme that also Google uses in, in, in pulling up the ranks that you get for websites. You're randomly walking around the internet, and then after your infinite walk around the internet, we say, how much time did you spend at CNN? How much time did you spend at the Columbia uh, Columbia University Library website. You know, how long did you spend at someone's personal website? So that's the idea of time. So it is, it's not actual time, it's a time that we use with the metaphor. I mean, it's, a, I mean, it's just visitation frequency. You just count how yeah. often, you know, how often uh, one of those random walkers is at a particular location. Visitation frequency makes a lot more sense to me. Hey, that's the term they use. Thank you. I'm going to use that one. Yes. Mm -hmm. Just like That's good. Does that, so that kind of answer it? Yes, and I, the, the big limitation in using the eigenvector is that when I use the impact vector, I am very clear what the tool that I'm using is. Absolutely. That's the power. If I use the eigenvector, I need to be perfectly clear what tool I'm using. Absolutely. And, it's, and, and because it's new and because we're so used to using impact vector, I think that's another one. Uh, advantage of the impact factor is that people are used to that. And so that's, uh, that's, that's a drawback of eigenfactor. factor. It's new. Um, but I think, you know, if it gets used and it really is a, a, a better way of evaluating it, then I think that, you know, or other measures like it, not just eigenfactor, factor, there are other measures that may be like Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a new perfect introduction to um, what, what we've been uh, doing at the Measure Project. Uh, the, the first couple of slides of stuff that you already heard, so I'm just going to flash through them. Essentially, what Measure is trying to do, it's, it's a, first of all, it's a research project that is supported by the Mellon Foundation, which at a nuclear weapons lab is something very special. Uh, I, I still don't understand quite how we were able to make them fund their research, uh, but other than that we're very uh, persuasive when it comes to these matters. Um, so it's a project that, in, that investigates sort of the broader question of how can we measure scholarly impact, scientific impact. So rather to focus on a particular metric, the focus is on a, a whole bunch of metrics. To look at the kind of rankings they produce, and instead of mapping signs, mapping the metrics. So we understand better what each metric means. Like the, the last question was, for example, well, you've got an eigenfactor, you've got an impact factor, you know, what, what do either of them mean? Right? And it's a problem in social science that's been addressed in social science quite a bit, because we talk about it. Now, you know, when we talk about matters in the real world, we use these abstract concepts like intelligence, personality, uh, impact. I do not really know what they mean, right? And there's really two uh, approaches to this problem. Either you define what it means, right? And then, and that's what it is. Or you actually measure the many ways, you look at the many ways in which the thing that you have a word for could conceivably be measured. Examine the measurements, look at their correlations and so on, and then determine some kind of a map of not just how these measurements relate, but, but, but how they relate to the thing that, that, that they're supposed to measure. Anyway. It's a little bit of a theoretical point here. We're all interested in scholarly assessment. I was an assistant professor for quite a while, and I can tell you citation statistics really, really do matter. And it's, it's just like parents at a school. You know, they, uh, very often, they don't care about what is being measured. They only care whether a, a particular number can be, uh, can be handed out and whether that number looks precise and look, looks trustworthy. And they'll go with that. And the reason, for, the reason why people love numbers so much is that it's just a lot easier to, to have a number rather than to actually have to read the papers and look at the file, look at the resume, that's just work, right? And uh, so that's where citation statistics have come in. Now, I've, I've actually, you know, I don't need to talk about this, the journal impact factor, there's a little diagram here uh, that, that sort of visualizes what the impact factor does. And essentially, if, if you want to, if, you pub if they publish the impact factor in the year 2003, they're just looking at 2003 citations of 2002, 2001, and they divide that by the number of articles published in those years. 
for that journal. So that's, is that a correct representation of the impact factors in measure? Now, it, it, as Jevin said, it's a, vi a fair approximation of journal status. However, it's, it's now used to rank authors themselves, and this is really s strange, right? Because it's a journal metric. It's a metric that's supposed to tell us how valuable a journal is. But then what, what do these university administrators, what they do is, well, you, you know, Johan, you publish the Nature. So Nature is a, has a very high impact factor. That means you have a high impact factor, right? Or that article that you publish is a high impact factor, which is totally bogus, because the distribution of cit citations to the articles within the journal is actually very much skewed. It is not in one of those nice symmetric distributions where you calculate the mean right, and you've got a good indication of where that, that distribution sits. No, it's actually a very skewed distribution. Some articles receive the bulk. It's, a, it's like the wealth distribu the distribution of wealth in the United States. Bill Gates is $15 billion, right? The people are dying in the streets. Now, is the United States wealthier than Sweden? Well, it depends on how, where you look at that distribution. The same applies to the Journal of Nature. Some articles get a lot of citations, and most of them get you know, much less. So if you calculate that an average, comes a little, it's a, you know, it becomes a little odd. You can do that for the journal as a whole, perhaps. But then when you start saying, well, this article was published in Nature, therefore, it is a good article, you don't know. Maybe that one article got no citations. It's actually being translated to departments as a whole, like the research assessment exercise that Jevin mentioned. Uh, they, they look at a, a whole department, an entire university, count the number of citations or the impact factors, whatever they do, and, and then come up with some, a ranking of universities that determines funding in England right now. Uh, regions and nations, like Sp Spain has, has made a very strong push to increase the impact factor of Spain. I've actually seen this in a paper. And you <laughs> it's, it's absolutely true. Uh, I know in my home country of Belgium, for example, it's, it's been, uh, the, the, the impact factor has also been very extensively used to evaluate individual researchers to the extent that the first thing that they ask you to fill out is an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, you list your A1 papers, as they call them. A1 papers are papers that were published in journals that are tracked by Thomson Reuters and journal citation records, right? All the other publications don't matter. They're only A1 publications, right? You list the impact factors, you sum them all up in that column, and you calculate an average. That's your impact factor. If it's too low, I presume you don't get the funding or the promotion. Right? Too high probably does not exist. So it does really matter a lot. But here's, here's my, my problem with this, this, whole, this whole setup. I think when we look at scholarly assessment nowadays, you know, you get scholarly assessment, and then you know people publish papers. That's the whole idea. Scientists publish papers and they publish them in journals. So the article journals. Now, for article journals, it's very easy to, to well, not very easy, but it's it's a trivial thing to extract citation data from those uh, uh, journal articles. And then we have citation metrics. We have the impact factor, the eigenfactor, and there's a whole bunch of other proposals out there. For example, you can calculate an H index for journals as well. The whole variety of them, right? Um, there's all kinds of issues with that approach, you know. And then for, well, first of all, the, the idea is that you publish stuff, right? You've got like a paper record that's cast in stone, right? And it's in the library. You look at the citations, you extract them, and it has this air of inevitability, uh, right? It's, it's been printed, so it must be true. Uh, the metrics are citation statistics because we understand that that works, right? We just count the number of citations. 100 citations is better than 50 citations. Everybody understands that as well. It's a metric that people say, at least I know what it is. It's a devil you know effect. There's all kinds of issues, though. There's a huge publication delay when we look at uh, citation statistics. And that by that publication delay, it's not just the delay of publication, but it's the delay in going from, a, from, from an idea to the actual citations in a citation database. So I have an idea. Right? Start reading papers. Right? Start talking to colleagues. Write the paper six months later. It may easily take a year, a year and a half to get that paper published. Right? Now we're only in phase one. Now that paper itself has to be read by some other scientists, right? while the, they're forming their ideas. Then they write a paper. Then they try to get it published. You look at that entire cycle, easily three to four years. So when we look at citation data, you know, at the, sort of the bottom end of where this all started, really what we're doing is it's like looking at a galaxy that's 50 million light years away. We're not seeing that galaxy as it exists today. We're seeing it as it existed 50 million light, uh, years ago. Right. It's the same with citation data. So when we map science on the basis of citation data, we're not mapping science, science as it exists today. We're mapping science as it existed. A core, well, at, we're mapping science as it is indicated by a citation database from 2004, 2005, and those citations are based on stuff that was published several years earlier. So there's a, there's a huge publication today here. There's also a sample size problem. In medicine, I know a lot of doctors read JMA. They never publish a paper. 
They never cite anything. Their opinions, their preferences, their, their view of what matters most are not recorded in citation metrics. In terms of resources, uh, the collection of these kind of statistics from the literature is actually uh, quite difficult. Uh, and I'm, I'm not saying that you know, people haven't done a great job, but it's quite difficult. Now, since I, you know, I'm, I'm I sort of straddle the, the two generations here. You know, I, you know I, I still remember my first cell phone. I actually played vinyl records. Uh, I, had a, I had a one kilobyte, uh, a little computer with a one kilobyte RAM memory when I was 12. I used to program basic. So just to give you an idea of what generation I'm, uh, I'm from. But what I do see is that we're in a new paradigm of publishing and, and readership and also in a new paradigm of how we measure what matters. We're trying to do the same thing, right, in scholarly assessment, but we're now in the electronic paradigm, where most of the stuff that is being published, well, a lot of the stuff that's being published are no longer journal articles. They're, you've got institutional repositories, you've got preprint multimedia, raw data software, operating system, databases. All of that stuff is now being published, right? Images, uh, analysis, you name it. It's all being published in addition to this, right? Now what we have is a metric that's based on, that's very specific, the stuff that is really, that used to be published on paper, but now we've got digital versions of it, but you still have to, you know, you have to pay a subscription to look at it. It doesn't work like that anymore. Now people go out, they read whatever they like, they use whatever they can find, and what, the things that they're looking at are, are, are very different from this, from this kind of material. On top of that, when we look at the kind of metrics that people are getting used to, you know, I've, you know I set up my first Facebook page about a year ago. And in Facebook, it really doesn't matter you know, necessarily how many friends you have, but what those friends are, and perhaps how many friends they have. Now we've got an eigenfactor situation, right? But it's, all, but it's, it's true. These are, this is the era of social networking, right? So the metrics that, that, that we look at, the metrics aren't you know, how many friends do you have, how many citations do you have, how many papers have you published, but the, the metrics are indicators of trust, prestige, popularity, and so on. They're, they're, they're these social network metrics. There's about 50 years of, of social network analysis out there that isn't being used when we look at published, uh, papers published in journals and then we calculate you know, how often things have been cited. Honestly, I think that's really, you know, not, th that's just not how things work anymore. So that's what Measure has been trying to address. Now, how about usage data? This is something that we've been looking at quite uh, intensively, right? We, we know about citation data as limitations. First of all, the community that you're measuring impact for is the are authors of journal articles. That's essentially what you're doing, because the, you count citations. Artifacts, journal articles in the JCR, social science, and science edition, about 8,500 journals at this point, right? But there's a lot more being published out there. I mean, conceivably, you could have 30,000, 25, 30,000 scholarly journals that matter. We at least have one year of publication data. So what we have is this set of Venn diagrams that become narrower and narrower. So on the top, we've got the scholarly community as a whole. It's a really big circle. We've got doctors, nurses, a whole bunch of people who read things and are involved in science, right? They, but they don't publish. They're not publishing authors. So their views are not reflected in the journal articles that we measure citations for a couple of years after the facts. And then we calculate an impact factor. That's one specific metric. But when it comes to usage data, there's a lot more interesting things that we can do. First of all, everyone's a user. Even the people who author papers are supposed to read other people's papers, right? right? Especially when they cite them. So when it comes to the, the subset of the scholarly community that we, that we look at when we measure usage, it's a much bigger subset than just a set of authors. When we look at the artifacts that we can measure usage data for, it's everything. Anything that has ever been accessed or downloaded, you can measure usage data for. It's very different from journal articles, right? Measuring citations for journal articles. So when we have that usage data, it actually pertains to a much broader subset of the scholarly community and the artifacts that are out there than citation data ever could. Also, there's hardly any delay. You, know, you throw something on the web, people start downloading it immediately. Right? It doesn't have to pass through peer review, be published, it's citation statistics collated. Once it's on the web or in any kind of environment, people can access it, and that's where your usage data come from. And now, on top of all of that, like Jevin has been talking about these random walks and so on, the, the one thing with the eigenfactor is this is not a critique. You know, it's, it, 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 don't get me wrong, but it's a random walk. You know what? People don't do random walks. When I'm on the web, it's not a random walk. 
when I read stuff online, I'm not doing a random walk. No one is. They're not random walks. You do a random walk because, because you don't know what people are actually doing. So it's a simulation. You're performing a simulation of where people go when they read stuff, right? But with usage data, you know. It's the usage data. You know where they go. The usage data tells you, right? So you don't have to do the simulation of a random walk. So usage data is very, very promising, and we've been looking at it quite a bit. So there's various initiatives that focus on uh, usage data. Counter is a really good one. IRS, Sushi, that site is doing this. So here's the two things that my talk will focus on, and I'll make it really fast. I won't focus on the theory too much. We're focused on how can we use usage data instead of citation data? Well, not instead of, but in, in complement to uh, uh, citation data. And can we explore what kind of network metrics in addition to the eigen factor, in addition to a whole bunch of other metrics that people propose, we can calculate from that data and to see whether we can look at all of these metrics and whether they tell us something about what, what, what we are really talking about when we talk about scholarly impact and how it can best be measured. Okay, the promise of usage data for oh, okay. So this is something we've actually done at LANL, and this is back in the, uh, in the olden days. This is when the, uh, the impact factors published uh, pertain to 2003. And here's what we did at Los Alamos National Laboratory. We measured what people are doing, right? Because we've got link resolve, we've got library services, they store logs, just like a website log. So they record what people do. And we rank the journals just by their, their, their usage. How often is a journal actually being read? The, the, the third column here is the impact factor for these journals, and these are the titles of the journals, right? So the top five journals, Physical Review Letters, Journal of Chemical Physics, Journal of Nuclear Materials, Physical Review E, and Journal of Applied Physics. These are a bunch of journals that matter a lot to, to, uh, to nuclear scientists. And that's what the lab does, right? It, it, it's, 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 it's plutonium processing and building of atom bombs. So these journals matter a lot to these people, and the usage data indicates that. The impact factors of these journals don't. I mean, look at the spread here, right? That, that would not be a good ranking if you're interested in what people at Los Alamos like. Now, for the, uh, a couple of years later, we got our hands on a California State University uh, usage uh, systems data. So the, the, we talked to the library and said, yeah, we record it centrally and you can have it. And so they FTP that over, and now we rank journals. Unfortunately, it's difficult to read. The green means that we've got a good correspondence between the usage ranking and the impact factor. You get JAMA, Science, Nature, Journal of the American Academy of Child Psychiatrics, and American Journal of Psychiatrics. So, what you see here is that as our data set expanded, so we went beyond that when we collected this usage data for the California State University system, our rankings became much more sort of congruent with sort of the general sense of impact that the impact factor represents, right? So again, so the community become, becomes larger and our usage rankings actually converge. Okay? So that's what we can do if we uh, increase the scale of our usage data. Now, with the measure project, we, I'll, I'll go into that a little bit, where we've, we've accumulated an incredible amount of usage data. And I think we've got a good chunk of the world's yearly usage in our databases. I'm, I, I'm, I'm, perhaps I'm exaggerating a little bit, but a good chunk. Not everything, but a good chunk of what's going on. I'll tell you how we did that. Um, now, with Measure, we did the same thing. You see a lot more green, right? You've got Science, Nature, PNAS, Journal of Biological Chemistry. So we see is that as we expand the community for which we record usage data, our rankings become more and more common sense, right? More and more indicative of what we mean by, by impact in general. This is just to show you that usage data is not random. It's actually quite meaningful. And the larger the community for which you uh, uh, record usage data, the more meaningful it becomes. So that, that's something that set us on the path to, to measure. What I honestly do is counting citations doesn't work very well. I think counting usage doesn't work very well either. Because if, again, you, you fall into the same trap. You just count how often something has been downloaded. Well, it's very easy for a student to write a Perl script and download his own paper 50,000 times, and then we'd be ranked very highly, right? So counting doesn't work very well. So as Jevin said, it's a really good point. We want metrics that are very difficult to cheat. Right? That's why PageRanks is so nice, because it uses that entire network. So, we, we were, so that's why we're looking at usage data, one, and network metrics, second, rather than just counting them. And uh, by the way, this is not raw usage, this is the usage page rank, which is a page rank that you can calculate from usage data that is not based on the simulation of a random walk, but on the actual walk for which you have the usage data. Okay. The measure project, this is our logo. It's, it's a ruler. Uh, it's pronounced measure, but we, uh, we gave it this name so that the French could call it mesure. Uh, I really ha I hate it when people call it miser because that's a, that's a Dutch word and it means uh, uh, it, it has a, a pejorative connotation. Uh, uh, so 
here's what the measure project is trying to do. Instead of looking at statistics, like 50 citations divided by 225, you know, good. We're trying to look at Web 2.0 social network metrics. Instead of just looking at the usage data for a single community, we're trying to gather and collect the world's usage to have the biggest possible sample that we can collect usage data for. Right? And then once we've done that, once we collected all of this usage data, we calculate a whole bunch of different metrics. We know that the differences in rankings are not caused due to the differences in the usage data, the community for which we report usage data, but they're actually uh, caused by the metrics themselves. Right? And then we can make a comparison of it. The other thing is we're not interested in small scale evaluations. You know, like a particular website has a log and they perform an analysis of it. We're looking at very large scale. At this point, we've already passed the one billion usage events or usage requests uh, threshold and, and still growing. So the general, general approach here after a very long introduction, which I apologize, we, we create a very large scale reference data set. So this is like a basic a baseline on, on which we perform our research. We collect usage, citation, and bibliographic data and combine it into one single database where all of it is related. So for a, for a paper, we know who used it, when they used it, what journal that paper appeared in, the citations for that journal, and that article. So we have all of this combined in one single database. We collected this usage data for various communities and various collections. Second stage, we investigate sampling issues. Do we really have a good chunk of the world's usage? Is this a good reference database? Is it representative? We map and characterize this colony community. I'll show you some of the maps. They're not as pretty as Jevons, but they're, they're based on usage data. Uh, we investigate the validity of the usage data and usage-based metrics. And we do that by, by the method of cross-validation. And this is something, because my background in psychology, it's what you do, right? Let's just say that we're trying to measure uh, intelligence. And someone comes up and says, well, the, the rule, knowing the rules of golf is a really good test for intelligence. Believe it or not, that used to be part of intelligence test in the 1920s. <laughs> If you didn't know golf, you were just not, you were just done. And uh, <laughs> I think that applies to many of us here. And then people thought that yeah, that's a good measurement of, of intelligence. And people said, well, I don't, I don't agree with that. I don't agree. Let, let, let's look at how well someone does it math. Right? And then look at whether it, it correlates. And I said, well, no, it doesn't correlate. You're right. Knowing the rules of golf doesn't correlate with being good at math. Right? So something's wrong here. That's cross-validation. It means that you, may, you have a hypothesis about how something can be measured. And then you compare it to something that supposedly also measures the same thing. If they correlate, right, the, the chances of that are pretty low, so you know you've got two good metrics. If they don't correlate, well, perhaps you need to introduce a third and a fourth and a fifth, and that, that is what we're doing in measure. Give you an, I'll show you some examples of that. Anyway, this is just some highfalutin language, but we're really looking to establish sort of a scientific basis to talk about uh, 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 rankings and scholar, uh, scientific assessment. Okay. Let me quickly talk to you about how we got this usage data. And the simple answer is we asked. So we just called Elsevier, we called Springer, we called uh, Thompson Hoyden, but by the way, very, uh, um, uh, a very cooperative partner for which we're quite grateful. They've, they've done really well for us. Uh, let's see, we called Ingenta, JSTOR, uh, uh, California State University System, University of California, University of Texas. And yes, we did get all of their usage data. It was as simple as setting up an FTP server. We signed some agreements, and they FTP'd all of the usage data for the past five or six years to that server. And so that's how we ended up with about a billion usage events. And our database at this point contains about 500 uh, million citations as well. So we threw all of that in. All of this is at the article level, too. Because we had specific agreements that the data that they had to give us had to be at the article level. At the the timestamps on the request that user issued had to be down to the second. We wanted the request type. We wanted a session identifier, and we didn't need the IP address because that's unreliable because of proxies and so on anyway. And that's what they did. They gave us this data. I still can't believe that that actually worked out. It took me a year to collect all of it, to set the agreements up, and some partners were a little more difficult than others. But overall, we, we got great uh, collaboration. So here's what we did. We talked to publishers and aggregators, got their usage data. We aggregated it, ingested it, deduplicated it because the other thing is when uh, you've got two usage data sets, right? And they, you know, they say that article A has been downloaded, and this usage data, data says that article B has been downloaded. You need to know whether that's the same article or not. So we usually ask for metadata or a unique identifying articles as well. So we've got huge deduplication algorithms that are, run, that are running on top of the metadata to decide whether you know, two articles are in fact the same uh, uh, article or not. Then we throw this in a reference data, data set. This can, we're using a, a semantic web triple stores, they call it. I, anyone here know about triple stores? You do? Very cool technology. 
and has a lot of advantages over a relational database, but we also have a relational database backend just, just in case, because in many cases it's still a little bit of a, uh, experimental technology. Now once we have that reference data set, we map it out just to see you know, what, what do we have, what are the characteristics, what, what can we learn from how this data set is structured, and then we do a me metric survey. At this point, we've calculated about 50 different metrics, and we're comparing what, you know, their rankings and what they mean. I'll show you uh, how that works. Okay, moving on. Okay, uh, so data normalization and ingestion, I won't go into this too much, but all of our data had to have uh, the following fields. A unique, uh, we wanted unique usage events, so we didn't want statistics. So we didn't want to know from that journal A has been downloaded 50 times. No, we wanted to know who downloaded this article, at what time, at what date, what kind of request did they issued, and was that request issued within the same session as another request? So that's why we have a session identifier, unique session identifier as well. So there's a huge difference with usage uh, statistics. Now, this is what the data looked like. This is very messy. We paid uh, two full-time developers to, uh, to, to uh, look at this data, ingest it, and normalize it. And they did a great job. Now, the, the, the final structure that we end up with, and this is kind of relevant for the uh, uh, the kind of analysis that we're, we're going to do, we can rebuild the entire click stream of users because we've got a session identifier. It's an anonymous session ident uh, identifier, so we know who the user is. We know it's the same user working from the same client. So we know that a user actually went from document one to document two, so that's where the random walk comes in. It's not a random walk, we have the walk. So it's D1 to D2, session is over, Some, someone starts a new session, goes from document three to document four. And for each of these requests, we have the request type, the type, and a whole bunch of other details as well in our database. Okay. Um, okay, now science mapping. This is a, a technique that we, with citation data, you already have a network. Excuse me? When you say, when you say type, do you mean the duration, or do you mean the, the second that they click on? Oh, no, not the duration, but you can calculate that from the click stream as well by looking at the time differential, but it's a date timestamp. Yeah, that's a good question. But yeah, well, you can calculate how long they actually looked at the document by looking at the, uh, the deltas, which is very interesting as well. So how do we actually, so with, as I was saying with the citation, uh, citation data leads to the citation network, right? It, it says so, this journal cites this journal. So you've got a network, right? But usage data is not that simple. Now most of you use Amazon.com or uh, Netflix. You notice that Amazon.com, when you buy a certain CD, it, it says 50% of people who bought this CD also bought this CD and this hair dryer and this deep fryer and so on, right? <laughs> Uh, they do the same, th 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 that's essentially what we're doing. So we look at these click streams, right? And every single click stream is a, session, uh, is a set of interactions, user requests, right? That pertain to a particular article. Now since articles are published in journals, right? We can convert each of these sequences to both article sequences or journal sequences within that session. Now what we do with these sequences, and this is just a simple Markov chain uh, method, is that we count the number of times that journal three was followed by journal one in those click streams. We count the number of times that happens. Right. In this case, journal three was followed by uh, followed journal two two times, right? And when we look at these uh, um, frequencies, we can convert them to probabilities, right? So in this case, the, the probability of someone going from journal one to journal three is fifty percent, right? Because here's one and here's one, right? Sum is two, so one over two, fifty percent. In this case, the probability of someone going from J, uh, journal two to journal three is one hundred percent, because it's two over two. So you just calculate these probabilities, and what you end up with is a network. This is not something we invented, by the way. Amazon.com uses it. Netflix uses it. Uh, everybody knows about the beer and diapers rule. Right? Supermarkets do this as well. Right? So when, when you leave the supermarket, people look, actually look at what's in your, your basket. Right? And the things that often co-occur in, 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 in shoppers' baskets are related. And one of the, the anecdotes I know is this is that beer and diapers are very strongly related. Uh, I'll have you guess why that is. It's not because babies go to the supermarkets and buy a six pack. It's because it, the mother stay at home and nurse send the fathers to the, uh, to the store. And what they do is they buy diapers and then pick up a six pack all around it, right? So that's why you find these kind of relations. It's, it's more or less the same me method. We calculate the probability that when you have a user, a, a shopper's basket, what is the probability if I see beer in that basket that I'll also find diapers, right? So that's essentially what we do. So once we've done that, we end up with something like this. So this is one of our usage maps. And this is a map, uh, it's, it's actually difficult to see the edges, but this is a, a map not so much of the flow of ideas in science, but a map of the actual flow of activity, of the behavioral flow in the sciences. Thank you, thank you very much. So each of these dots is a journal. And when there's a connection between the journal, it means that they have a high frequency 
of, there's a high frequency of one journal being followed by another journal. Right? So in this case, you've got neuroimaging, and this is neuroscience. Right? And what it means is that the, the line here means that this journal is very often, uh, very often follows this journal in the traffic patterns that we observe in our data. So you can be, produce these beautiful maps. And actually, Jevin, Jevin is right. I mean, when you look, most people say you've got a, a circle of signs. That there's a circle here, but it, it is much more like a, like a U, like a U shape, right? And it's only because this arc here is is, is quite tenuous. But I mean, look at this. You've got science, nature, and PNAS sitting here: physics, chemistry, and environmental sciences. A whole bunch of applied sciences like healthcare, dermatology, allergy, asthma, sports medicine, livestock nutrition. This whole cluster here is stuff that conceivably you wouldn't find in the citation network because they're the behavioral patterns of practitioners, people who don't publish journal articles but read them, right? And those reading patterns we have. So look, I mean, there's, there's beautiful things here. I can go on and on. It's just like Jevin said, you know, we do, we do this every morning. We just look at it and you've got psychology up here, which connects to cognitive science, which connects to education, urban studies. Urban studies then connects to remote sensing, geology, which then connects back to material sciences, connects to physics, connects to medicine, biology, and so on and so on. Beautiful, beautiful maps that tell you what's going on in science right now. Right? Because this is very recent usage data. So instead of looking at citation data, we know what's going on right now, and it's, be it's behavioral. So it doesn't matter whether this journal is being cited a lot. If a lot of people read it in conjunction with these journals, they're going to be related in this map. Uh, it seems a whole bunch of different things that you can, you can well, anyway, anyone who wants to see these maps, I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy to go into detail. Now, here's a, a citation map for the same year. Right, so the, the, here the, there would be no delay. Uh, and you can see this is a much poorer map, I think, in terms of the structure, in terms of the interdisciplinary movements that you see. You've got physics, chemistry, biology. That's it. There's no entomology. There's no public health. There's no allergy and asthma. There's no urban sensing. All of that stuff is just gone. There's hardly any social sciences. Because if you look at the total body mass of citations in the journal citation records, I think the social sciences represent only 5 to 7 percent of all citations, including the social science uh, version of the journal citation records. What it simply means in the social science, you've got a lot more practitioners. And those practitioners, their behavior is recorded in usage data. Now that's this half of the, uh, of the graph, but it's not recorded in citation data. So you get a very partial view of what's going on in science. Now, as a prelude to the kind of metrics that we calculated, uh, I usually give this neuroimaging, right? Has very few connections in this graph. Looks kind of isolated. If that journal wasn't there, you would, have, you would have disconnected these two branches of the graph, right? So that's a metric of importance, right? And I'll go into what kind of metric this is, but it, essentially it's being called between the centrality. How often does a journal sit on the paths that connect other journals? So in this case, Neuroimaging could have a very low impact factor, but it may have a very high betweenness in this usage graph and in the citation graph. Okay, so that brings us to the metrics that we calculated. I think when you look at metrics, there's really two big classes that you can look at. The first class is just the th statistics. That's like the presidential elections, right? Obama gets 50,000 votes. McCain gets 49,999 votes. Obama has the election, right? Just counting endorsements. That's this entire class of metrics. Now, I think, and that's the Web 2.0 stuff, there's a whole bunch of what we call structural metrics, metrics that are based on the structure of the graph. You know, where a particular item is positioned in the graph and its structure will determine how highly ranked it is. If you look at the random walkers here, that's page rank, that's the eigenfactor, but there's a whole bunch of other ones that I really, really like, even though I think page rank is the coolest metric. You've got shortest path, between the centrality is very, very interesting. You've got closeness centrality, and then a whole bunch of degree metrics that are actually quite similar these metrics over here because they just count the number of uh, c connections that point to a particular journal. Here's a sort of a visual representation of how this works. So let's look at the shortest path metrics that you can get. And again, this is, we didn't invent this. This is just standard social network analysis. Let's look at cl closeness centrality. The shortest path metrics are based on calculating the shortest path connections between pairs of, of items in that network. So in this case, between in and out, there's a shortest path. There's many other paths in this network, right, but they belong. So we calculate mathematically which of these paths is the shortest path. The closeness centrality of a journal is the average length of the shortest path that, uh, that connects that journal to all other journals in the network. 
That's closeness and value. In, in essence, it tells you if you were to include friend of a friend of a friend connections, how close is that journal to all other journals in the network? That's the shortest path. Between the centrality, which is my favorite, and actually is how often does the journal sit on the closest, on, on the shortest paths between all other uh, between all other journals in the network. Right? What between the centrality indicates is if that journal a journal is high between the centrality and you take it out, it destroys the graph because you've disrupted all of the shortest paths. Right? It's a little bit like let's just say you had a terrorist cell. Who would you want to kill? Right? Is it the guy with the the high closeness centrality, the high with the high, uh, the guy with the high between the centrality? Well, it de depends on what kind of damage you want to inflict on the network. Right? If you want to disrupt their communications and their ability to operate as a cell, you'd kill the guy that has the highest between the centrality. Right? Um, there's all kinds of ways to calculate this. Newman is just a different different definition of um, uh, 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 between the centrality. Random walk, again, what you simulate is just people jumping randomly from one to the other using the connections in your network and then counting how often they end up at a particular journal, a particular item in the network. That's, a, that's, pay, that's page rank. A, a bunch that we looked at, you've got um, in degree, how, much, how many errors actually point to a particular item, how many errors point from a particular item. Right? That's just like count, determining the impact factor. But you can also look at the information entropy of the connections if they're weighted. So in this case, what you're saying is, how promiscuous is that journal or that item in accepting all kinds of connections, regardless of where they come from in that network? Right? So let's just say I have only one connection. That connection happens to be Einstein. Right? That's good for me. Right? I only have that one connection. I only have that one best friend. That's good for me. My entropy would be low. But let's just say I have you know, 50,000 friends, like on my, my Facebook page. Right? But none of them are very good friends, just acquaintances. And they don't matter all that much. Then my entropy would be very high. So entropy is just a way of looking how broad is that, the, 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 amount, the, the amount of influences on you in that network. So there's a whole bunch of different metrics that you can calculate. And these metrics. We can calculate now because we've got a usage map. We can calculate for both the usage graph as well as the citation graph. So we take all of these metrics, we calculate, the, uh, calculate them, not just we're, we're up to uh, the 2007 version of the JCR, so this is incorrect. And we calculate all of these metrics. And to make it complicated, we gave them code names. So if we calculated weighted between this centrality on the citation network, it was site dash WBW. If we calculated uh, page rank, on the citation graph that I showed you, it would be site dash EP. Now, for the usage graph, I showed you that usage network, we can do the same thing. We calculate the same metrics. Why not? So we've got uh, uses between us, right? Uses closeness, page rank, out degree entropy, out degree, in degree entropy, uh, weighted page rank. So we've got a whole bunch of them, right? In total, we're up to about 60 metrics at, that, that, uh, at this point. I'm not showing all of these. OK, now, in terms of the, the just to show you that this does actually work, uh, this, is the, this is the page rank. This is the, the eigenfactor ranking, really. So you've got science, nature, journal of biological chemistry, PNAS on top. Works really well. Compare this to the impact factor, by the way, it doesn't work so well. The reason for that is, is, is probably because we're not looking at it in a domain specific sense. But I also think that the, 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 the impact factor favors these review journals. Everybody cites a review journal, right? They're cited all the time, not because people care about them, but just because you, know, because you want to provide some background information. So review journals are going to have high impact factors. There's, there's no escaping that fact. PageRank, on the other hand, that looks at the total network, uh, total network of, uh, of citations will actually rank things higher that are cited by other things that are cited highly. Right? Well, in, with the impact factor, it doesn't matter where the citations come from. You calculate between the centrality. Look at how PNAS is now at the top. That means it's more interdisciplinary because it, it's more often on the shortest paths connecting all of these different journals. Closeness and centrality, same thing, in degree, in degree entropy. I mean, these are beautiful rankings. Now, when it comes to usage, our usage rankings are merely at end, by the way. Uh, so please don't fall asleep on me just yet. We, uh, need to, we need to shut down. Oh, we need to shut down? We need to close. Oh, that's why you're standing by the door? That's why I'm standing by the door. Okay, okay. <laughs> Uh, can I have two more minutes? Two more minutes. Two more minutes, okay. So here, here are the rankings that we produced off of the usage network that we generated. And look at these. These are actually very much in congruence. It, I mean, it, it demonstrates to you that this, this does actually work, that usage isn't random. 
science nature PNAS, science nature PNAS, science nature PNAS, and so on, right? So they're, they're very good, they're, they're good rankings. But here comes the point about the cross-validation. Without actually comparing how all of these rankings correlate, we know nothing about what they mean and which of these we should actually use, right? And so that's where a little trick comes in uh, that, um, into the picture that we call um, a factor analysis. Now we can correlate any two metrics. We select the pair and we calculate the correlation coefficient. We can do that for all pairs of metrics that we calculate and we end up with a table. Like metric eight has a 0.68 correlation with metric two. Right? We can do it for all of these metrics. Right? Now, it's very difficult to find patterns in, in tables like that. So what we do is we create a map. And in that map, we position each metric such that its geometrical distance in that map is commensurate to its correlation. So the, the, the uh, metrics that are highly correlated, we put them close together. And the metrics that are not strongly correlated, we put them far apart. Now, the way that this works is as we keep adding metrics to this map, that map bec becomes much more solid, right? Because there's only that many geometrical positions where you can put metric four, uh, metric five in this case, right? Because all of the distances have to be commensurate to the correlations that it has with the metrics already in the map. It's called the principal component analysis. Now, once we've done that, okay, one more minute, we end up with a map something like this. And what it, do, what, it, what it does, each of the metrics here is positioned such that its distances to the other metrics corresponds to the correlations that we calculated between the rankings that we produce. So metrics that are close together produce similar rankings. And metrics that are far apart produce rankings that are very different. Now look at this. The impact factor is nearly an outlier in this distribution, which means that its correlations to all of these other metrics I, I mentioned, including the eigenfactor, is actually pretty large. And the usage metrics are very reliable because they all point to the exact same thing, regardless of how the metric is defined. In fact, some of these usage metrics, like usage between us, correlate better to their citation counterparts than either of them do to the, to the impact factor. I'm sorry, we're kind of hating on the impact factor here, though. <laughs> going to be like that. But the truth is that what this map tells us is that the impact factor is a measure of scholarly impact, scientific impact, but it's a very specific metric. It produces rankings that when you compare them to the rankings of all of these other metrics are kind of like an outlier, right? Well, these on the other hand, they cluster very well and they're very close to these, which means that if you combine all of these together, you have a sense of impact that is much more a consensus sense of impact than you, uh, than you would have with the impact factor. What we also noticed, by the way, if you look at the actual distribution vertically, these are the degree metrics, right? And this is page rank in between us. Page rank in between us, one of the things that they do is they look at the total network structure. So instead of just looking how many citations you receive, they look at where do those citations come from and how, they how do they position you in the network. So these metrics down here, we look at them as indicating prestige or power or something like that. Up here, we just count how many citations something receives. It, it, it's just popularity, right? So the, 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 sort of the folksy way of saying it, right, is that you've got sort of popularity metrics on top here and the, the prestige, me prestige metrics at the bottom. So if you scale it like that and you look at it, what we have really is a map, not just of these metrics, but a map of scientific impact itself and how it can be measured. So if you want to measure prestige, you can choose to do that either on the basis of citation data or, or, uh, uh, or citation data or usage data. But if you want recent prestige, right? If you want prestige as it is now, you want to use usage data. If you want prestige as it existed two or three years ago with a greater degree of stability, you can use these metrics. If you want stuff that is sort of more specific, you can use either of these metrics. And we actually produced a new map, and the results are even more outspoken, where at some point we nearly had to remove the impact factor from the map because it was an, such an outlier. Correlations was just too low. So that being said, uh, we haven't explored, I mean, you've got Terra Incognita here, right? So we've got maps, we've got uh, dragons in this map, right? We don't know what kind of metrics you could come up with to fill the holes here, but we're definitely trying. We would also do cluster analysis while we go in, into that. The one thing I do wanted to show you very, very quickly, oh, it's this one here, hold on, is that we're actually working on services as well, although, you know, clearly that's not our uh, main objective. Um, let me zoom out a little bit. Okay, well, it makes it look. I can't display all of this, and uh, the resolution is quite low. But 
we're working on something similar to what Jevin actually show, showed, where you have, this is a usage map of science. You can click on any journal that you like and explore its connections in that map. So I can, for example, click on this journal here. It's highlighted together with all its connections in the graph. And what you're doing when you trace these connections is that you're really tracing the actions of millions of users that have established these connections. Like every single edge corresponds to nearly 200,000 traversals that we recorded in, uh, in, the, uh, in our usage data. Now, it's a two, it, the, the, there's two parts of the, the interface. For every journal that you selected, we produce a scatter plot, which is similar to what Jevin just showed you. You can choose any metric that you like. For example, let's just say you're interested in sighted closeness and you want to compare that to uh, usage page rank. Right? What it will do is it will actually position a whole bunch of journals here. The one that I clicked is called conservation biology, but American Nationalist does really well on both of these metrics. And this little one here, colonial water birds, doesn't do so well on either of them. Right? But what it allows you to do is treat scientific impact as a multi-dimensional problem. Right? Where you, just like intelligence, some people are very good at math, Others are very good at language, and we acknowledge them for being smart people just the same. I hope that in the future when we look at scientific impact and we try to evaluate what scientific impact means, we, you know, people can go to their dean and go to their department chair and say, yeah, sure, my papers aren't cited much, right? But they're read by mil millions of students worldwide, and they're read by people who read other stuff that does have high impact factors. So all of these different metrics can be used to provide a sort of much more sort of refined and multidimensional sense of what impact uh, really means, and that's what we're trying to do with the uh, the measure project. Um, I'm going to conclude now. I still went over those two minutes, didn't I? So in, in conclusion, I think after one and a half years of measure, we're nearly at the end of this project. I think what we've done is we created the largest existing reference data set for both, both usage data and citation data, and we're still expanding and looking for ways to expand it. Uh, I think it's really interesting that we can actually map science from the viewpoint of users, not from scholarly articles. There's a, there's this, whole, this whole section of that map that I showed you is not based on what authors or experts cite, but what people actually do, even if they don't publish. And I hope that we've defined some kind of a, you know, a, 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 an infrastructure for a continued research program. So we're looking for like, collaborations, people who want to come in and work with us on this data and, uh, and do uh, interesting things. Uh, and that, that sort of concludes my, uh, my talk. Thank you very much. Thanks to our speakers. Thank you for coming. Uh, please come down with your questions and comments and uh, spend some time with the panelists. Thank you very much.